But last November and December, an ABC News team spent six weeks touring the country. Except for battle zones, we were allowed to go wherever we chose. We traveled more than a thousand miles, visiting 11 of Cambodia's 19 provinces. And as we went, the scarcity of food was apparent. Cambodia, of course, was not always the pathetic, desperate nation we now see. Angkor Wat represents the glory that was Cambodia. In the debates that have been waged for months now over Cambodia, there have been numerous attempts to assign blame for what has happened here. Our starting point in tackling the tragedy of Cambodia is that there are many victims, but in this story, there are no heroes. Cambodians, Americans, Chinese, Russians, and Vietnamese all share equal blame for what has happened here. From 1970 to 1975, there was constant warfare on Cambodian soil. The Americans against the Vietnamese. Cambodians against Cambodians. What emerged from the chaos was a disciplined and determined communist force, the Khmer Rouge, one of the cruelest movements in history. They came out of the mountains, led by this man, Paul Pot. What followed was one of the greatest bloodbaths of recent times. It was a peasant revolution, and cities were bad. Everyone ordered out. Families were split up. Monasteries closed. Religion abolished. So were schools, books, money, and modern medicine. Doctors, former army officers, the educated, government workers were systematically hunted down and executed. Last year, the Vietnamese overthrew the Khmer Rouge, and what was left retreated to the mountains of northwest Cambodia. The secret camps can be reached only on foot, the command post constantly on the run. But here in his jungle hideout is the most hated man in Cambodia, Paul Pot, demoted now from prime minister to simply commander of the guerrilla forces. In the only interview ever given to American television, Paul Pott outlined for ABC News producer Phil Lewis what he had hoped to accomplish in Cambodia. Our wish is that uh, all our people from all uh, social strata enjoy equally the same uh, standard of living materially uh, morally and culturally. But the evidence we found inside Cambodia is that fear and death were the great equalizers. The number of orphans has risen dramatically. People still search for loved ones everywhere. Quite by accident, we found our interpreter's two nieces, 200 miles from their old home in Phnom Penh. They hadn't seen each other in five years. Like all the city people under Pol Pot, they've been forced to work in the fields. We helped Tida and Shrena get back to Phnom Penh for a reunion with their sole surviving aunt. She has good emotion to be back in Phnom Penh, but she has found nothing, nobody else, her parents has, have died. Her father, they took him away. Her father was a colonel killed by Paul Pot. Against overwhelming obstacles, Cambodia is struggling to recover 
and scrambling to live. In the remote northwest, people are sustained by a precarious lifeline. Little organized relief has reached here, so every day, hundreds of people bring food from the relief operations in Thailand. For some, it's strictly business, trading rice and other supplies for gold and jewelry. For most, it's a way to keep their families alive. What kind of food does he bring? Only rice. And how much will it sell for in uh, Cambodia? He's not going to sell. He's going to give these to uh, four families in his responsibility because the father and the mother have been died. So he take care of these uh, of his relatives, four families. For all, it's a dangerous journey. Sometimes Thai troops shoot at them and Vietnamese troops demand bribes. What is basic to Cambodia's survival is an adequate and organized means of getting international relief supplies to the people. And that is not yet in place.